Your home with Build Aid on Mix 93.8. Proudly brought to you by AfriSam. AfriSam, creating concrete possibilities. Build Aid on Mix 93.8 FM. Good evening. My name is Graham Alexander, and as usual, it's Kay looking after all of us and Simon looking after the desk. I'm going to be chatting to Rogan Hill from Schindler's Attorneys this evening. We're going to talk about all things legal, and there are some groundbreaking cases that have come up recently. Kay, we're also going to be having some fun. Yeah, it's, it's not a question tonight, it's a little bit of a poll, so there are no right or wrong answers, and you're very lucky that there are no wrong answers, because we were thinking last week, we might just give away one of the pies from the vending machine downstairs <laughs> for the person who gets the wrong. question wrong. <laughs> yeah, gets it wrong. <laughs> wrong, gets it wrong. But we're not going to do that to you, because those, those pies freak us all out. So I've got a list of places where you probably indulged in a little bit of debauchery back in the day. And I'm interested to know which one was the most frequented place. I've probably missed a few out, um, but here's a list. Heaven, The Doors, Fancy That, Plum Crazy, Thunderdome, White Horse Inn, Bella Natalie. I'm sure you all went there. Boobs, San Lorenzo, Q's, Dirtbox, Idols, Chelsea, Caesars, Mandy's, Dylan's, Caricatures, and Zeppelin's. Okay, wasn't the White Horse in a boxing club? No. <laughs> no, yeah, it was. After midnight or yeah. something. After a few beers. But send us your... your Favourite club from back in the day and a few memories if you have them on 41348. My name is Graham Alexander. I'm chatting to Rogan Hill from Schindler's Attorneys. Now, if we look at a typical rental agreement um, in a residential rental agreement, the tenant has probably got an agreement with the landlord who then has an agreement with the town council. So that wouldn't apply then, because if he hasn't paid his rent, you, you have a problem with the landlord, not the council. Well, that's pretty much it. You're not going to find too many um, residential leaseholders that have their own account with the city. Um, if you're paying your lights and your water to your landlord and he's not paying it to the council, unfortunately they can still come cut you off. This isn't going to protect you. Um, you will, of course, have a remedy against the landlord for not paying the rents and causing you to not have lights and water. Yeah. So this is more situation and it's generally in commercial settings where there's such high water and electricity usage that the tenant will have their own account with the city. Yeah. Something that's been in the news recently, in fact, I, was I think I was reading it this week, um, is that municipalities have to prove that their bill is correct. Now that, we, we've had a number of discussions on this on this show that, you know, the council cuts your water off and now uh, for 20,000 rand or something, you've got a problem. You've got to prove that you're right. So this has changed. Yeah, absolutely. This is a big, big case. Um, this is the case of Gallagher Estates, and it's up against the city of Johannesburg. Um, What's important to understand in these situations is where the onus of proof lies and the burden of proof. And previously, or up to now, you would have to prove that your bill was incorrect if you believed it was incorrect. Um, so if you would get your bill and you'd have a meter that was giving you wild readings, you would go to the city and say, no, there's, there's something wrong with this bill, it's incorrect, and they would get you to, well, you would have to prove it in order to show it. The courts came along and they said, you know what, this is actually too onerous on the consumer. How can you as a consumer prove that your meter is broken? Um, you don't, you're not equipped to do that, you don't have the capacity to do that. Only the municipality has the actual capacity to prove uh, whether a meter is working or not. So what's important in this case is the court said they, they, they moved the burden of proof onto the municipality and they now need to prove to you that this meter is correct. They need to provide you with the meter tests, um, show that the meter was tested correctly, and that the readings are correct um, if you decide to challenge it. It's quite a big step. What happens while this dispute is in place? Um, can they cut your water off? Um, and <laughs> if this carries on for two years? Well, well the question is what they out. can do and what they, and what they do do. Um, yeah. uh, so technically, and according to the law, if you have an ongoing dispute with the municipality and that dispute is unresolved and you can show that it's unresolved, and they're not allowed to cut you off. They need to resolve your dispute. Um, so 
So that's that's the the good side. That is the good side. <laughs> yeah. The question is whether they whether they that actually prevents them from doing it. And there's lots of times when they come along and issue disconnection notices and disconnect people without resolving their disputes, which is coming a big problem. I guess that most of the disputes are around the, the usage of water or the quantity of water. Um, but I guess there's also sometimes administrative problems where they've invoiced you incorrectly or something. So this burden of proof becomes an administrative issue. Um, it, it does become an administrative issue. Um, what this case dealt with specifically is, so for example, the, uh, the person who was challenging their bill they had meter readings for a period where their readings were normal. Then this meter came in and their readings were wild, wildly higher than they had been previously. They removed that meter and put in a new meter and their readings were back to normal. So objectively, you look at this and all indications say that there's probably something wrong with that meter. Despite that being the case, somehow you were still obligated to prove that that meter was broken, even though reasonably it seems that it was broken. Yeah. So what's important here is that the court decided it's it's beyond your capability as a consumer. You don't have the tools or the equipment or the know-how. The only remedy you have is to ask the municipality to test the meter themselves and provide you with the result of that test, which um, doesn't really shift yeah. the balance in your favor too much. So this is quite an important ruling, and um, it's going to ensure that the municipality invoices you correctly. Um, and some of this is really great news for, for the consumer, making the consumer's life a little easier when you're up against a giant like a municipality and you've got to prove all sorts of things. Um, the, the next topic, Rogan, is with regard to um, valuation of, of um, properties. Yes. Which the councils do fairly regularly. So you may have a property that's worth two million and then they decide, no, it's not two million, it's 2.2, .2, or you could argue with them and say, no, it's 1.8. Or, But the, the issue here is that you can uh, uh, um, put in another valuation once a year, but the council can revalue your property whenever they like. Well, there's a new mechanism that's come about. I think to paint the picture off, it really works is every couple of years there'll be a big general valuation role where the municipality will come along and they'll value every property um, in the city. And the last one of those was done in 2013. And you get given your uh, property valuation, that of course dictates what your rates are going to be for the next five or six years. Every year in about June or July, they publish a supplementary valuation role, which is something that they do in between the main roles. What they do on these roles is they'll add all the new properties that have come into existence. Um, they will maybe revalue properties that did exist uh, and that sort of thing. So what has historically happened is maybe the council will decide that something's changed in your area and your valuation needs to change and they are going to notify you in advance that your valuation is going to change on a particular date. So they'll come to you a few months in advance and say, um, in July on the next roll, we're going to revalue your property to something higher or lower, whatever it is. And that gives you an opportunity to challenge that. If you don't believe it's correct, you go and you provide additional evidence and you, you challenge the proposed valuation. Um, whether you do or whether you don't, or whatever happens, then your property becomes revalued on that date. Normally as I said, June or July of every year. What the municipalities have been doing, well, what Johannesburg has been doing, is they would issue a new type of notice which would instantly revalue your property. They came along and they would say, one month you would suddenly find your bill, well, your rates account having gone up by a massive amount, and they would have changed your, um, your valuation. And then they say, your opportunity to challenge this will be at the next roll, which would be in July the following year. So if you get your valuation changed in October, for example, the first opportunity you would have to challenge this would be in the role um, six months, seven months later. In the meantime, your rates have gone up, you have, um, you're obliged to pay your increased rates this whole time. And, uh, for a big property or a commercial property, that can be quite significant. Um, you mentioned a, a Mitchell judgment that, that sort of upset the apple cart. So the Mitchell judgment is the one that did upset the apple cart. Um, what everybody thinks that this judgment says is that the new owner can be held liable for the old owner's debts. And that, uh, based on this judgment, that is what the municipalities were using um, in a situation like Chantel's to disconnect people and hold them liable. 
Um, but that isn't what the Mitchell judgment said. What it said was that if there are debt, uh, debts attached to the old owners in the old owner's name to your property, the municipality can attach your property to pay those debts, which sounds very scary. Essentially what they're saying is that your property still stands security um, for the old owner's debts. And so in theory, what could happen is the municipality could get a judgment against the old owner. They could um, get an execution order against that property, which is now in your name, and sell the property to pay those debts. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and it hasn't been tested on a constitutional level yet, so we'll see. We'll see where that judgment goes. But this case now with with um, Chantel and 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 your firm, this is a precedent now. Yeah, I think it, I think it clarifies the issue quite a bit. Um, it, it makes it clear that just because this debt is still attached to your property doesn't mean they can be attributed to the new owner. They can't make you liable for those debts, and they certainly can't take credit control action against you for this. Uh, if they do, it's, uh, it's yeah. already been found to be unlawful. So, Kay, the most popular club or hotel? Doors and Bellas. That's what I kind of thought would happen. But, I mean, there are names of clubs and hotels that are coming up that I've never heard of. I'm, I'm astounded at the amount of jolling that's been happening. Um, one, though, that did come up from Peter was Smugglers, and that hadn't come up before. And I know that's quite an old haunt. And then King of Clubs as well. Um, from Cliff and 206 from this. Those are ones I remember going to. Okay, you should start a Facebook page with the, the Build Aid on Mixed page about all these, all uh, these there's hundreds. Yeah, I, I love all the stories as well. Just a note here, Hank is saying that he's um, gone off the grid, so he is still living in the house, but he's, he's actually quite comfy. Well, <laughs> there you go. See what <laughs> happens. But he, but he really, really wants to. Yeah, um, become innovative when, yes. you, when they cut <laughs> you off. Absolutely. And Simon, thanks so much for looking after the desk. I believe you're going to be playing some great music as we go on this evening. Yep, up for another two hours, so keep tuned. Yeah. And Ian, thanks for videoing as usual. Okay, look, looking after all of us. And a very special thank you to my guest, Rogan Hill. Thanks so much for coming to chat to us. Thanks for having us, Graham. And uh, best of luck to you, Chantal. Yep, from all of us. Um, to, to Chantal and her little one and the rest of her, her family, her other beautiful little one and big one. We do this every Wednesday between 6 and 7. Chat to you next week. Ciao. Awesome. Your home with Build Aid on Mix brings you all sorts of interesting info about building. Graham Alexander chats to different guests every Wednesday evening between 6 and 7. Proudly brought to you by AfriSam. AfriSam, creating concrete possibilities.